studying the book of Galatians together, but perhaps before you turn to Galatians, you might come to 2 Timothy. Just a reminder, 2 Timothy, in chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, I was just going to read this to you, but good if you see it. In verse 16, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So it is God's word. As such, it deserves our complete and full attention. Uh, if you're in 2 Timothy, look in chapter 2, verse 15. Be diligent, be zealous, um, passionate, uh, to present yourselves approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed. Note this, accurately handling the word of truth. Just a reminder to us, and uh, I know uh, you're here and committed to the truth, but studying the word is serious business, a danger that settles down over the evangelical church, if I can just use that broad term, for churches that claim to be Bible-believing, is we become lighter and more superficial with the word of God. This is serious business with God and must be with us. God has spoken. Now it says you be diligent and apply yourself earnestly to the study of my word so that I can approve you as one who handles my word correctly. It's not enough to handle it. And, uh, you know, this desire I shared with you recent theological uh, article in a theological quarterly. We ought to move away from this emphasis on having to deal so seriously with the word and its original meaning and so on. And just cut right to the application of the word and how pastors and teachers uh, feel and think it could be applicable to you. Let's just do that. You know, we're not looking for the approval of men. Uh, we have to be serious about the word and handle it accurately. Now, Paul's aware this is going to have diminishing returns in some respect. Because down in chapter 4, verse 3, after exhorting Timothy in verse 2 to preach the word in season and out of season when it's popular and when it's not, if I can uh, express it that way, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they won't endure healthy teaching. Isn't that terrible? Um, people who profess to believe the word, uh, trust Christ, but they're not interested in healthy teaching, but they heap for themselves teachers and the popularizing of the Word of God. I mention this because we're in two challenging books. On Sunday mornings, we study the book of Revelation. Uh, we have to pay attention and give careful consideration. Come over to the book of Galatians, where we are studying, and we're in chapter 3. And sometimes you get into these sections like this and you say, you know, we're into the details and the Mosaic law and no longer the Mosaic law. And, you know, do I have to know all these details? Well, why do we think God said it? I mean, he says he's going to hold us accountable for handling accurately his word. He didn't ask us to be his editors uh, you know, to do, as they have done, a Reader's Digest form of the Bible. Let's just highlight the things that might be more interesting. And let's do more general paraphrasing of the Bible that 
won't mire people down in details they're probably not interested in anyway. But we as God's people aren't here to do studies for people who aren't interested in the Word of God. We have the Spirit of God dwelling in us. Remember Paul had to rebuke the Corinthians? He says, something sad has happened with the Corinthian church. I can't give you the meat of the Word of God. I have to continue to give you milk because you haven't matured. And I'm not giving this as a rebuke to you, just an encouragement. It's a challenge. You know, it's fine that babies uh, get milk. And we have baby food, you know, specially prepared, easily digested for them. But it's not good to be 20 and having just the milk or the baby food. Something's wrong. And that's what he says to the Corinthian church. And that leads to all kinds of problems. The conflicts and divisions and everything else they have, that's just a reflection of your immaturity. So we come to grapple with the Word of God in the book of Galatians, chapter 3. And I appreciate these are challenging sections. He's comparing uh, the Mosaic covenant with the new covenant given in Christ. Uh, the work of Christ has brought to an end the Mosaic covenant. Some don't, still don't understand that. They think the Mosaic law is still in force. That we still live under uh, the Ten Commandments and other portions of the law. And we've emphasized verse 16 in our previous study. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. And he's contrasting the promise given to Abraham and the law given to Moses. And there is a major difference there. Uh, the promise was given to Abraham. The law was given to Moses. And to Abraham's descendant was given uh, the promise. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Now here he makes one of those detailed uh, unfoldings that would not have been clear with just the Old Testament. To his seed. He does not say to seeds as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed that is to Christ. Now remember what he says in verse 17. The law came 430 years after the promise was given to Abraham. And what was given to Moses, the law, can't invalidate or change what was given to Abraham. So, very important point. Now he makes clear in the promise given to Abraham... There is the word seed used. And as we talked about, seed can be used as a plural or it can be used as a singular. It can be used collectively. And it is repeatedly in the Old Testament for all the descendants of Abraham. It can also be used singularly to refer to one person. That's what he's talking about in verse 16. Um, Come back to the book of Genesis. We've done this, but it becomes such a major issue. It's crucial we understand it. In uh, beginning chapter 12. And you have the summary of the Abrahamic covenant given in the opening verses of chapter 12. And what God promises to Abraham. And uh, he says in verse 3, at the last line there, And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Uh, but he's going to be referring to a particular person who is a descendant of Abraham, who will bring the blessing, as you're aware. Uh, down in verse 7, You'll see seed used as a collective for all the descendants. 
Verse 7, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your seed, we have a translated descendants. But as you have in your margin, it is the word seed. No different when it's referring to all of his descendants, plural, uh, collectively, or just one. But he says, and to your seed, I will give this land. Come down to chapter 13. Verse 15, for all the land which you see, I will give to you and your seed. Well, he's talking about physical land because he said, look, north, south, east, west. We've looked at this. Uh, but I will make, verse 16, your seed as the dust of the earth, so that if anyone can number the dust of the earth, then your seed can be. Obviously, he's talking about more than one person. Because he says that your seed won't be able to be counted and walk about the land, I will give it to you. Now, you come over to chapter 22, and there are many other references to the seed, but uh, we've looked at those in prior studies. Look in chapter 22. Now, he repeats uh, what he's promised to Abraham, and we've looked at the repeat, uh, repeating of the blessings. He says in verse 17, in verse 16, he says, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord. Note that this is important. This is a promise. There is not a contingency here. Remember in the establishing of the covenant in chapter 15 and the formalizing of it with the dividing of the animals, Abraham, Abraham went to sleep and God passed through the divided animals taking full responsibility for that covenant. That's what he's saying in verse 16. By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord. Verse 17, indeed I will greatly bless you. I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens, as the sand which is on the seashore. Your seed will possess the gate of their enemies. That's plural, collectively. Uh, your descendants, the Jewish people. But note verse 18. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. The New Testament doesn't change anything promised. But in Galatians chapter 3, verse 16, Paul makes clear that God's intention in verse 18 was a singular seed. So you see, he doesn't change what the covenant promises, what the promise was, but he does clarify. There are seed in verse 17 as the descendants, the Jewish people as we know them, who receive special promises. But verse 18 is talking about seed in a singular. So later revelation can clarify, but it can't change. It can't wipe out the promises of verse 17 to his physical descendants. But there is a clarification made that verse 18 is referring to seed singular. Because the blessings, not only for the Jewish people, but for all the nations of the earth, would come through one descendant of Abraham. Jesus Christ, and we have his genealogy uh, from both sides uh, in uh, Matthew and also in Luke. So I want you to see, there's no changing, because remember, once a covenant has been ratified, we've seen in Galatians, you can't change its provisions. So there's no changing of the provisions of the Abrahamic covenant with the coming of the Messiah. doesn't matter whether it's 400 years ago by or 2,000 years go by. You have the Abrahamic covenant given as promised, and you can't change its provisions. Um, but he didn't change anything. There are provisions made for all of his descendants, and there is a focus on what could be accomplished by only one descendant. That's where New Testament 
Additional revelation gives more clarity. It can add to it, but it can't change it. Uh, while you're here, um, this promise is repeated. Remember, the line has to come Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. So come over to chapter 26 of Genesis. And now we're dealing with Abraham's son, Isaac. And remember, he's the only one. He's the son of promise. There are other sons, Ishmael being the firstborn to Abraham, but it had to be the child uh, that comes from Abraham with his wife, Sarah, and then to Jacob. Here it's Isaac. And so you have the Lord appeared to him in verse 2. In verse 3, sojourn in this land, I will be with you, bless you. Uh, And bless you, for to you and your seed, I will give all these lands. I will establish the oath which I swore to your father Abraham. Again, that seed collectively on physical land. He's telling him, you stay in this land. Don't go down to Egypt because this land is the land I'm going to give you. Can't change that. That is inherent repeatedly in the promise of this covenant. I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven. Give your descendants all these lands. That's his, it's more than just one. That's his physical descendants. And then note the last part. By your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Well, what we have later revealing that the blessings founded in the salvation provision of one descendant of Abraham will provide blessings to all nations. So you see the distinction and yet no change. I keep emphasizing this because we talk about reform theology, covenant theology. They think with the coming of Christ, everything changes. And now Israel doesn't have a future because all the promises are focused in one person Christ. Well, the enablement for it all to be accomplished does center in Christ. But the last part of verse 4 doesn't nullify what is said in verse 3 in the beginning of verse 4. All that we have in Galatians 3.16 is a clarification and a distinction drawn. You might not have picked up if we didn't have later revelation. Come one more passage and then we have to go to Galatians chapter 28. You have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So this is the line. And then with Jacob, he'll have 12 sons. They'll be the 12 tribes. And you see uh, the seed enlarging uh, the physical descendants. In chapter 28, um, we're going to go to, well, it's verse 10. We have Jacob, and here we have Jacob's ladder. We've been in this passage not too long ago. In verse 13, the Lord stood above, above this ladder reaching to heaven. I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to your seed. So it's a physical land, the very land you're on, I will give to your seed, collectively, your descendants. Your seed will be like the dust of the earth. And you see the repetition. We've only picked out these to go from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We will spread out to the west, the east, the north, the south in you. Now know this. And in your seed. In you and in your seed. Remember in Genesis 12. God had said to Abraham at the beginning there. First uh, note of the Abrahamic covenant. In you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Now here you have it. In you and in your seed all the families of the earth will be blessed. You have that same breaking out. And it's the descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, singular Christ, that all the nations will experience blessing, the salvation he provides. And that salvation he provides will be the foundation, of course, for the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who also have the faith of Abraham to experience the provision, not only of God's spiritual salvation, but the fulfillment of all he's promised 
including the inheriting of the land and the setting up of the kingdom. So this understanding later revelation can clarify and sometimes makes additions, but it doesn't change the provisions. So we understand with greater clarity that the Abrahamic covenant includes this provision for the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Collectively, their descendants, physical descendants. But the word seed, and you can see how God is so clear, provides salvation in one person. All right, with that now we come back to Galatians. A little bit of review from chapter 16. Um, and that's why verse 17, which we looked at of Galatians 3, the law which came 430 years does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God. So we saw how that was already included in the provisions of that covenant. But there's a clarity. There was provision for the physical descendants and there was provision which would be provided by one descendant. Uh, but no change in the covenant. It's just clarified in a way we might not have understood. Just like some of the prophecies of the first coming and the second coming of Christ. They didn't become clear until later revelation had come. So, uh, the law given later can't nullify what God had ratified earlier. So if the inheritance is based on law, verse 18, it's no longer based on promise. But God has granted it to Abraham by promise. Now we get to this point, it might sound like, well, then what was, why did he give the law? I mean, what's the purpose of bringing in the law? So you have verse 19, why the law then? I mean, it seems like you've done such a good job, Paul, of showing that the uh, Mosaic law, the Mosaic covenant, couldn't add to or change the Abrahamic covenant, and that was given by promise, well, then what's the purpose of the law? That's what he's going to uh, give. It was added because of transgressions. So important here. The law had a purpose. It's a later addition. Um, so it is outside the bounds, if you will, of the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, the other covenants of the Old Testament, uh, like the Davidic covenant and... Uh, the Palestinian covenant, the new covenant, are all developments of the Abrahamic covenant in its provisions. The Mosaic covenant is a later addition. It was added because of transgressions. And that word we have translated because of. Um, and it indicates here uh, that what he did when he gave the Mosaic law, and this ties to what he's talking about with the one seed. The law was given to clarify the issue of sin. It was added because of transgressions. A word that uh, here we have translated because of can denote purpose. It was added for the purpose of transgressions. It was to make clear sin. Now the law wasn't given to cause people to sin. But because of their sin, they react to the law that way, as we'll see. But it was given to show sin as sin. We'll look more at that in a moment. Uh, so that would prepare the way for the coming of the seed which was necessary to deal with sin. So after living under the law for 1,400 or 1,500 years, Israel should have been ready for the Messiah uh, because it revealed how sinful they were. 
and they needed a sacrifice, things like that. Let's look and see uh, here. It was added because of transgressions, having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. The promise that he's talked about. Uh, Back in verse 8, all the nations will be blessed in you. Remember, that's the gospel beforehand. The seed, which is Christ, in verse 16. Uh, So the law was an add-on, not part of the Mosaic covenant. That's important. Um, To show sin as sin, and it was only given, it was given later, and for a designated period of time. Until the seed promised in the Abrahamic covenant would come. Then it would have served its purpose. So you see the law there. Uh, It is something added later for a set duration. What was promised to Abraham has no conditions, and will ultimately be fulfilled forever. So, uh, until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. Uh, Come back to Romans chapter 3. We noted that Galatians is something of uh, an abbreviated Romans in many ways. Romans chapter 3, Paul goes into greater detail. We're not going to go through all that Paul has to say. You note verse 20 of Romans 3. For through the, the last statement there, through the law comes the knowledge of sin. What the law did was reveal sin as sin. So now you had clarification. God says, you must do this. You must not do this. Now it was clear. When you don't do what God says you must do, you have sinned. When he do, you do what he says you must not do, you have sinned. So what the law does is turn the light on the real condition of mankind by revealing. Well, I don't know. Am I a sinner? Well, you know, you have 613 commandments in the law. You have all these rules and regulations and requirements and how you can be defiled before God. You must bring these sacrifices to acknowledge your need of a sacrifice. But those sacrifices could never take away sin. So they were what? Revealing to people their sin and their need for a Savior. Um, Come over to chapter 7 while you're here of Romans. Talking about the law. And he talks about the problems of the law here as well. And note what he says, verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had said, you shall not covet. But then the problem was sin taking opportunity through the commandment produced coveting me in every kind. We see this going on in the world today as we reveal to people what God says is sin. All of a sudden, that's what they want to do. There's something about our fallen nature. And it's revealed. Well, that's what the Mosaic law did for the nation Israel. And you understand, the law was given to the nation Israel. They were the only, it's the only nation God chose for himself. Um, he didn't give the Mosaic law for the Assyrians. And there was no priesthood provided in Assyria. The priest that could bring the sacrifices that God required was in the nation Israel. 
and was uh, Aaron, and then the descendants, and only those of the tribe of Levi could function in the context of priestly activity and all this. Uh, so it revealed sin to the nation. doesn't mean everybody else wasn't sinners, but there wasn't the clarity of it. Uh, so that's what he is saying here. And then sin took opportunity. And when the law came, it shined a light so bright you know, it had that negative effect because Israel kept breaking the law, which indicated what? They were sinners under condemnation. So, um, verse 10, this commandment, which was the result in life, proved to result in death for me. From the standpoint, all God was saying was what his holiness required. So, no problem. Do it. How... That's wonderful. Now we know how to be holy before God. The problem is verse 11. Sin taking opportunity through the commandment deceived it. Through it killed me. I mean, it doesn't mean others weren't sinners and they were sinners before the law was given. But now there is a clarity given. Uh, so nothing wrong with the law. Verse 12. The law is holy. The commandment is holy, righteous, and good. And I see this quoted in the uh, Reform theology, because they say, well, see, we want the law. It's good. The problem is the law couldn't accomplish, so it served its purpose. It was only active until Christ came. Um, did that which is good, verse 13, become a cause of death for me? May it never be. It was sin. It wasn't the law that made me a sinner. It was my response to God's law. Paul is saying, that revealed me to be a sinner. Uh, it didn't make me sin. Uh, when you tell your child not to do something and he does it, you didn't make him sin. Um, but having that instruction revealed when he rebelled. So the problem, verse 14, the law is spiritual. I am of flesh, sold in bondage to sin. And that's why he says in verse 18, I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. Um, sin dwells in me. Evil is present in me. Verse 20, verse 21. All right, uh, come back to Galatians. So the law was added because of transgressions for the purpose of transgressions, to reveal the need. And that's why even today we start out, what, we have to talk to people about the fact they're sinners. Otherwise, you know, people still go, yeah, I've trusted Christ. But they think they have to go to church. They have to be baptized. They have to take communion. They have to go to confession. They have to fill in whatever the religious convictions are to be acceptable. And they don't understand what sin does. Sin uh, condemns you. Okay, note the character of the law. It was ordained through angels by the... Uh, and of a mediator. Now remember here, it was uh, only at the end until the seed would come. So it had a beginning and it had an ordained end. That's uh, key in the plan of God. So this is not a covenant or a promise like given to Abraham. This is an add-on necessary for a period of time. It was ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator. Um, and um, there's not much said in the Old Testament about angels' role in the giving of the law. Psalm 68, we won't turn there, verse 17 says, the chariots of God are myriads, thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them at, as at Sinai. In his holiness. Well, we're not told in the account given that the angels are there. And then later in the book of Acts, chapter 7, Stephen refers to the law as ordained by angels. And Hebrews chapter 2, verse 2 says the law spoken through angels. But here his point is it was ordained through angels, so those were involved. 
in giving it to Moses, who is the mediator. So he was the one between God and men, and the go-between. And there's a characteristic of the Mosaic law. We call it a conditional covenant. At the establishing of the Abrahamic covenant, when it was ratified, what was uh, Abraham doing? Remember in uh, Genesis 15? He was sleeping. God swore by himself, as we read a little bit ago. But at the giving of the Mosaic Law, come back to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus 19. You have here, uh, we're going to have the giving of the Mosaic Law. So they gather here. Uh, Moses, verse 3, went up to the mountain, and then he's instructed by God to tell the people this. And uh, verse 5, then if you will keep, obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you'll be my people. And the end of verse 6, these are the words you shall speak to the sons of Israel. So Moses comes down to the people, tells them all the words the Lord had commanded him. Verse 7. And all the people answered together and said, all the Lord has spoken, we will do. So you see Moses is the mediator. God says, here, here are the conditions of the covenant. You pass them on to the people. The people says, we'll sign on to the covenant. So he mediates and brings it between, uh, brings them together. This is different than the Abrahamic covenant. He's contrasting the difference um, we won't look at the other passages because of time, but in Exodus 20, verse 19, 21, 22, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 5, verse 27, Moses is referred to as the mediator between God and the people. So come back to Galatians. They were ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed would come. So you ought to have marked in your Bible what, in verse 19, why the law? It was added because of transgressions. That's its beginning point. Until the seed would come. That's its culminating point. So now we got clarification. The law was not only added later, it was had a cutoff point. To whom the promise had been made. Now we have the mediator. Verse 20, now a mediator is not for one party only, whereas God is one. And that's the great statement for Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Um, the Lord uh, our God is one. Uh, there's only one God. Now we have a mediator. We say, you know, just a little bit aside, you might say, well, isn't Christ the mediator of a new covenant? And isn't there one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus in uh, 1 Timothy 2? Yes, but God is one. Who is Jesus Christ? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In Him, all the fullness of deity dwelt in bodily form. So he is a man as a mediator between God and men, but he is not just a man. He is God. So you have God, in effect, mediating like he did with Abraham. It's only God involved. That's the point here. Now, a mediator is not for one, whereas God is one. The point is the distinction. The Abrahamic covenant was mediated in a, a human kind of agreement with Moses getting a message from God, bringing it to the people, then the people agreed to it. With Christ being a mediator, it's on a totally different level. He came in what? 
fulfilled what was required for the covenant himself, the God-man. So with the new covenant, God simply says, here's what I'm going to do. And Christ comes, the second person of the Godhead, and does it. So now a mediator is not for one, but God is one. Uh, there is a uniqueness. This goes back to the singularity of the seed in verse 16. The one seed, Christ. And the recognition here, that one who will implement the new covenant is God. So God did it himself. The second person of the triune God has implemented the new covenant in his blood. What did we say when we partook of the communion service? This cup is the new covenant in my blood, Jesus said. Well, uh, what about our agreement to it? Well, this is the covenant established by the work of God. The Mosaic covenant in its installation was done in such a way to make clear to man he couldn't keep it. This kind of mutual agreement, God says this is what you must do. To be holy for me. Israel says, we'll do it. And then what happens? Failure, 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 failure. And the Mosaic covenant was filled with the provision for failure. Because what do you have? Priest and the necessity of sacrifices being offered again and again and again and again and again. All of this what? Prepare for the coming of the one, the seed singular, God himself coming to earth to do what only he could do. Um, the Lord served his purpose, showed the futility of man being able by his actions to be holy. It revealed he is corrupt within. And uh, he's constantly coming back for forgiveness. So, verse 21, Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? May it never be. For if a law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would have been based on the law. Uh, the point is clear. Um, no problem with the law. It just showed what? Man was sinful. As we saw in chapter 7, Paul says, I'm evil. Sin uh, dwells in me. And so here I have the law. Well, I'd be willing. God, just tell me what you want done. I'll do it. Well, there's only one who did that, Christ. But we are sinners. So um, the problem was... A law couldn't impart life because of man's sinful condition. It's not a problem with the law. We read in chapter 7, the law is holy and righteous and good. But you give it to a people enslaved to sin, all it does is turn on the light and reveal how sinful they really are and how hopeless and helpless they are to redeem themselves. So you have the sacrifice reminding them their sin. They need a sacrifice in anticipation for Christ. And then verse uh, 22, but the scripture has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. So you see, God has done what needs to be done. All you can do is believe him. Contrary to the law. The law said, do this and you'll be holy. But no one did it. Now, what does God say? I have done this. Believe it and you'll be holy. A whole different uh, situation. Not me agreeing 
that I'll do what you require, the deeds of the law. So we had the law for 1,500 years showing Israel. And all you have to do is read Israel's history. They fail repeatedly. Moses is on the mountain getting the law, and he comes down with the Ten Commandments in the stone, and Israel's all over the place. So he breaks the stones, got to do it again, and it's just going on and on and on. And that should have was the intention. It wasn't to cause Israel to sin. It was to remind them. And so now Christ has come. The purpose of the law has been accomplished. And uh, we'll get into that. It's going to be a little break. But uh, he's flowing through here. So you understand uh, the law. Because what is happening, people are trying to infiltrate the Galatian churches and tell people they have to put themselves under the law. You see why? You have to understand Scripture. Um, and with clarity. Uh, the law was only until the seed would come. It is an attack on Scripture for people to say, well, we're still under the law. We shouldn't be confused on this. Well, it says one seed... So all the promises, even those given to the collective descendants of Abraham, they've all been fulfilled spiritually. That's a lie. That's a distortion and corruption of Scripture. That is changing the provisions of a covenant ratified that God says can't be changed. There's no excuse for being confused. That's why Paul started chapter 3. You foolish Galatians, who's put you under a spell? Another way of saying that. There is no excuse to be confused. Uh, it's clear. These provisions were in the Abrahamic covenant for a seed collectively, for a seed singularly. And the blessing of salvation that would be provided and foundational for everything. And the law was added so that sin would be clearer and more clearly seen and how great the need was and how incapable, unable, and unwilling sinful men are to uh, obey God and live a holy life, uh, to cleanse themselves. So the provision of the sacrifices that could never take away sin. And he's going to go on to say, those sins forgiven back in the days when the law was operative were forgiven not on the basis of those animal sacrifices, but on the basis of the sacrifice that the seed singular would provide. And that's how we are forgiven today. And not on the basis of our performance, because we are no more successful in that than anyone else was in history. We recognize God has done it. He has established a new covenant, which is within the framework of the Abrahamic covenant. And that will become clear as we move along. Therefore, salvation is available to Jew and Gentile alike when they respond in faith to the covenant provision God has provided in Christ. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit who enlightens our minds, gives us understanding. We have to be diligent. Lord, we have to apply ourselves earnestly to the study of your word so that we can handle it correctly and accurately. We desire your approval as we handle your precious word. Lord, as we live out your word in our lives in a variety of ways and places in the week before us, we pray that you might be honored. And we pray in Christ's name. Amen.